Hello, how are you? Welcome to Whiskey and Wool. My name is Shannon, and I think this is episode four or five for season three of my Knitter's Life series. Um, Yeah, this is the third year in a row I have been doing Knitter's Life, which really just is a sort of way to talk about knitting, but also incorporate little bits of what's happening in my life. Many of you know I have been planning a move to move house and I am downsizing a little bit. I'm in what I would call a two-ish bedroom. It's definitely a large one bedroom um, with room for bed, which the second bed is actually right here. You can see it just behind Martha. I filmed a little video of what's happening, like what I've been up to, because I heard from a few of you about missing, I usually record every two weeks, and and this has been three weeks. So I heard from a few people, which is fine, I love it it when you reach out to me to make sure I'm okay. So many people reach out and say, are you okay? Yes, yes I am. Um, I just have been dealing with a lot of stuff. Um, It's more, it's not so much the physical stuff that's not so bad but it's like all the emotional stuff that goes along with like packing up your stuff and going through your things and deciding what to keep and what to get rid of and what to you know what what to make space for and for me like it's a very real problem of space um, and I don't because I'm still in my old space I'm not sure yet how much room I'll have so I'm going on the assumption that I won't have a lot think I will I think I'm gonna have more than I think I'm gonna have um so I, I've just been going through things that I've kept for the last like 15 10 15 years because if you have the space you don't worry about whether or not something needs to be thrown out but when you're limited with space you do so I've been yeah been working on that so um I just wanted to share a, a quick video uh it includes my uh, solution for storing my yarn Um, and yeah watch the clip and come back i thought you might like to see a little update on my move my head is so full of all the stuff i need to do this over here these are some pieces of furniture that i'm selling and so is that uh, game system right there it's left over from when my sons were here And uh, this bed is also getting sold. I, this bed is actually in this alcove nook of my living room. And I use it for, you know, sleeping when people come visit um, and also for staging (laughs) future projects. This is, I'm in the process of organizing my yarn for the move and just like clearing out things. Um, So yeah, so this, There's a furniture company coming to pick up all of this stuff and then they'll pay me cash for it. Um, And then in terms of my knitting stuff, uh, this dresser here used to hold all my yarn. It's now empty. I've cleaned it all out to to prepare in preparation for the move. And then I have um, most of the yarn cleared out of here. I just need to buy one more storage container um, and then the next thing will be this, cause this dresser will also be sold. Um, and then the next thing is to clear off my, um, idea board and organize the tools that are here. Um, as well as, uh, actually this drawer has tools in it too. So I just need to figure out some sort of organizational system for that. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that's what's happening. Um, most of the rest of the house is not packed yet because I'm still using most of the things. Um, what I've mostly done is cleared out closets. So like this is a walk-in closet. It's pretty much cleared out some fiber in there, but not much. Um, and, uh, yeah, you see also my, my latest FO blocking which I'm sure you've you've seen or will see in this uh longer video but yeah that is it's just so so much um and I'm happy I get a chance to do it incrementally because it is it would be so overwhelming if I had a hard deadline (laughs) this will give you an idea of what I'm thinking 
of course it's a mess because I'm moving, <laughs> but this is what I'm thinking in terms of my yarn storage. So you see those baskets, they're all now full with yarn. Um, and yeah, so this workbench piece that is cluttered right now with stuff that's in progress um, of being moved and such, this is going to the new place and this will be um, in, in an alcove in my living room area so and i'll show you all of that when i after the move happens sometime this later this spring or summer um but yeah this is this is what i'm thinking like um, minus those those right there but like i think i'm gonna put the jars of um you know specialized yarn or mini skeins will all be right along there and uh in here and where this cubby is there will be space, there's space for a chair, and there's my, my yarn winder and my Swift. They're going to be put away when I'm not using them and then taken out. I'll probably not use them on the workbench. I'll probably use them on a dining room table. Um, but anyway, this is the system to set them up on the on the workbench. If you're, if you're curious, if you have a similar situation, this bench is too thick for this clamp. So I jerry-rigged a two by four small piece with a big six inch clamp. And then the, the winder is clamped to the two by four. Um, so that's what's going on there. Yeah. So, um, and also in this alcove, I have two smaller shelf units that match these. They're just lower to the ground, a little lower and narrower. So they'll fit right in there. Um, and so they'll be recessed a bit so that the chair will fit. And that will be where my tools are and my blocking mats and, you know, other, other extra yarn that you saw hanging around in the other room. So, yeah, so this is what's happening. And just so that you get the full view... Here is all the stuff I've packed so far. I'm still in the process of packing a lot of it. And um, yeah, lately what I've been concentrating on is my jewelry supplies, which are all right there. And then also um, in, in this cubby here, these are the two little shelves that'll go in the alcove behind me um, that I just showed you. So yeah, it's been, it's been pretty busy. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, boy. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. So where my workbench is right now, it's in an unfinished room that is on the same floor where the rest of my apartment is. So if it looks kind of janky and weird, that's why, but also I'm packing. <laughs> so there's just crap everywhere, but I think it's going to look really great. I ordered a new, um, chair for that workbench that is, um, a it's oak and it has a white stain on it. So I think it's going to look really beautiful, especially in the new space. So yeah, I am, I am, I'm nervous, anxious, excited, all of those. And I have one other complicating factor and that is that the new building, or it's not a new building, but it's an old building um, that I'm moving into. It's a building that had been a hotel in the night from the 1910s to, to until 1970. And then they converted it to apartments. So it's a really cool, has a lot of history, cool old building. They, uh, my broker, my mortgage broker is having trouble getting, um, the latest inspection materials, which is sort of indicate indicative to me that they don't sell a lot of apartments in this building. So she's having trouble. We're going to have to pull the plug soon. Um, so if it's not going to work out. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it'll work out. Because it is, I don't want to start all over. Starting all over is going to really suck. Um, luckily, I haven't invested any, you know, in buying anything for that particular space. But I have been doing a lot of downsizing, just thinking about things that, I need to, I know I won't be able to fit no matter where I move, but it's, it's, it's been very anxiety provoking and very, very ah, nail biting, nail biting. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Oh my goodness. Well, anyway, you didn't come to find out about that. You're here for yarn, right? And knitting and all of that. Um, and also, I, if you're new here, welcome. And if you're uh, returning, thank you so much for coming back and checking out my latest episode. Um, 
I usually start all my episodes with a whiskey or gin chat. I filmed a gin chat last week thinking that I was going to be filming a full episode and things just got, you know, I just ran out of time um, in the weekend with all the other things that I needed to do. So this is from last week. Um, it is, yeah, watch it. It's about 10 minutes. If you're new here, I do a whiskey or gin chat where I just sip a whiskey or gin with you and explain the whatever production notes I can find. Some places don't have a lot of production notes and other ones are really, really good about explaining their process. So um, this one particular one does not have a lot. It's on, I think it's under 10 minutes this time around. Um, but it was a very interesting gin and I will see you when you get back. I'll tell you where to skip to if you want to skip. Hey there. Um, I am going to do a little gin chat with you today and I had a little trouble actually deciding between gin or whiskey so I've had this one dark brown gin that I thought might be interesting. It is called Chillgrove Bramble Edition which um, implies berries and yeah let me tell you about it. Um, I'm gonna pour it out in a minute so Chillgrove Gin is um, the brainchild of a husband-wife team, uh, Christopher and, and Celia. Do I have their last name? I thought I saw it somewhere. They have a long last name, Beaumont Hutchings. Um, yes, so they opened a um, distillery in the town of Chillgrove in 2014. So it's a fairly new distillery. And they um, they tout themselves as being the only grape-based gins in the UK. Um, and it's so funny. I didn't know that this was grape-based when I pulled it to taste it um, because I have talked about how I've tasted a grape-based gin in the past and I didn't like it so much, but the one I tasted last time was perfect, was good. So I'm, I have high hopes for this. Also berries, berries. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, okay, so the um, couple actually, I think they're um, from the UK originally, but they worked and lived in Australia for a little while. Um, and they have a gin that they call Blue Water that makes the connection between those two countries and they mingle UK-based um botanicals with Australian botanicals but that's not this one um, so they do have they do have uh, the, this bramble edition which is their newest gin but it's not that new I think it came out in 2018 and they have their signature gin and they also have a vodka those are what they make um, their bottles are really cool they're like rectangular shaped and very clean lines um, really really like the way it looks and the way it's marketed um, the gins tend to be on the high end for us here in the U.S. They're in the $40, $45 range. Um, I think they're like 35 pounds um, in U.K. So it makes it a more high-end gin. Um, what can I tell you about... Um, they are combining Dutch production methods with British production methods because... Chila, Celia, or Chilia, I'm not sure how she pronounces it, was born to a Dutch mother and a British father. So she um, kind of, you know, married those two things together. Um, yeah, so it's, it. yes, it's a great base spirit. I already told you that. Um, apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently... A couple hundred years ago, there was, you know, or up until a couple hundred years ago, grape-based gin was the norm. Um, and then there was a bad um, climate period where grapes were not growing well and they switched to grain. Um, so it's grains, grains and potatoes. So grape-based spirit for gin was very common. Um, 
Grape spirit is supposed to have a richer mouthfeel and a light ethereal fruitiness that makes it shine when it's distilled. Um, and this particular one is pretty interesting in the way that they do it. They take about a month to make it, which is really, really slow for gin. It could be, it could be done in two to three days. Um, I think that the fastest gin production is like pretty close to one day. Um, so yeah, they, they take a long time to make this so that the juniper stays up front. Otherwise it would not be able to be called, it wouldn't be able, they wouldn't be able to call it a London dry gin. Um, so yeah, so they, they layer in the blackberries, um, very, very slowly, the blackberry tastes and you're supposed to be able to taste all of the 12 botanicals that they use in it. Um, they don't admit to anything other than blackberry. We know about the grape and um, juniper. Let's see what we get. Um, I have poured this out into a weed dram and um, I have a few drops of water in there. Wow, it it has a pretty smooth um, smell. Oh, wow. Oh, it's really sweet. It has a, that mingling of the juniper with the berries really works. It's a little bit of a piney taste that you would get from juniper. There's definitely something going on in the background, which I assume is the grape base that they used. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think a good way to describe it is like a London Dry with a hint of berry. It's like, it's pretty nice. It's um, really, really drinkable. This would be great neat or with maybe chilled a bit, um, one ice cube maybe or something like that probably make a great gin and seltzer or a great gin and tonic. Um, they have a bunch of recipes on their website um, if you are interested in perusing that. Let me tell you what they say and then we'll look at what a an expert says about it. I found actually a lot of reviews for their signature gin which has been around for a while but not so many for their um, for this bramble gin. But this is what they say. On the nose, piney juniper backed by soft blackberry, faint stone fruit. I would say that is exactly what I smelled. A lot of berry, but not overwhelming. On the palate, clean, smooth, assertive, soft blackberry and red currant balance with fresh juniper, as well as this complimentary cit crisp citrus and subtle spice. Warm berry flavor in harmony with dry juniper at the end. So those... So what I was tasting, like usually you can taste nuances and stuff of other flavors, but it sounds like what I was tasting was pretty much what um, they expected you would taste. So let's see if I can find another expert review. Um, uh, here's what I have found from Master of Malt. One of the better berry tasting, berry based gins, the tasting notes are pretty um, accurate in terms of the juniper and berry combo. There's a subtle spiced warmth about it that I tasted that too, as well as an over, overall rich red currant flavor. Mix it with strawberry halves and it comes out slightly sweeter with the right mixer which brings a variation of its flavor. With so many berry gins around, it's hard for any of them to stand head and shoulders above the rest. Chill Grove is definitely one of the better and it avoids being overly sweet, sticky trap that others fall into. I did not know that there were tons of berry gins. I tend not to drink flavored gins um, just because I find gins very flavorful on their own and I really like those botanical citrusy flavors. So, um, it's why it's become one of my go-tos for, you know, for when I want just a, you know, a nice cocktail or something along those lines um, to just chill and relax at the end of the day. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this 
little gin chat and I know I am going to go make a gin and seltzer with this. Um, I already brought up some ice and I've got my seltzer re ready so I'm gonna enjoy a nice cocktail and um, oh, enjoy the rest of my late afternoon early evening. Take care. Welcome back. You know that gin Usually Jen has got a whole bunch of complex herbal tastes and that particular one was very much berries and juniper. That was it. There wasn't a lot of complexity to it. It was good though. If you like berry flavors, you'd probably, you'll probably like that. You'll probably enjoy it. Um, and um, all of the gins that I'm tasting from my gin advent calendar that I got in 2022 are all UK based uh, gins. So yeah, if you're a UK viewer and you like Jen, you're gonna like those uh, those episodes. Just a quick side note: I've been dealing with also besides all of the move, I've also been dealing with some sinus congestion, and it ha it's not infection level yet. Um, it's more viral based, and that has really curtailed any drinking I've been doing just because it just makes me feel worse. So I <laughs> really the last like two weeks. I've drank very, very little. <laughs> that drink that I had that for the tasting was the last one that I had, um, and probably it had been a week or so before I had had that at all, but it is no fun being sick. And um, yeah, I'm drinking um, some OJ with ice, which is my usual way. I know a lot of people don't do that with their OJ, but it's a little too acidic for me straight so I always like ice and often we'll put a little seltzer too just to make it a little more light and refreshing using a straw to try to keep my lipstick on <laughs> anyway well let's talk about the knitting and spinning I have spinning today um we'll talk about that in a little bit but I want to first share with you the finished object that you're seeing. This is Ward by Sloan Rosenthal. And I knit it out of La Bienna May Winsley Dale. Winsley? Winsley Worsted. Winsley is, um, I think you can see in the picture, Winsley Sheep. You should Google them. They have very long uh, curly Q locks. Um, so I think... I don't know of any yarns that's 100% Winsleydale. Um, so this particular one is 25% Winsleydale and it is 25% Falkland Merino and 50% Falkland Coriadale. It is a white base, uh, Amy has shared, and it takes color very brightly. And I think that this sweater is going to be tinting the entire footage that I'm filming today um, because certain colors really kind of make the camera struggle to create a color balance and this is one it's a very very vivid green um, it is her colorway lush and I bought it when she did a free shipping promo um, the thing with La Bienna May's yarn at least that I have found is that even if you're if you're not in France or Europe, maybe the EU, it mm, makes not that big of a difference. But for US buyers, for at least for me here in the US, I live in New Jersey, coming to you from Northern New Jersey, right near New York City. I will live closer to New York City very soon if all goes well. <laughs> I will live 10 minutes away from New York. Right now I'm about an hour away, um, 40 minutes if I drive, an hour if I get in mass transit. Over there I'm gonna be 10 minutes. 13 minutes to one of my son's homes. He lives in Washington Heights in the, in Manhattan. About 30 minutes to the other son's home where now it's an hour, so it'll cut that in half. And um, sorry about this tangent. And about 20 minutes uh, using mass transit, maybe 15 if I happen to hit the, the transfer correctly. Um, yeah. So it's so, it's going to be so nice. I'm gonna live very close to New York City. Nitty City in New York, if you know it, will actually be my LYS <laughs> once I move because it will be the closest. If I could fly there across the river, it would be like a two minute flight. Um, <laughs> or if I had a boat where I could row or motor across, it would be like 10 minutes. Um, anyway, sorry about the tangent. 
I live outside of New York City um, in a suburb outside of New York right now and where I live is very countrified and uh, very wooded. There's a lot of wildlife around. It's beautiful. Um, but it's very isolating. So I want to live closer to people and um, closer to friends and family that live in New York in the city. So where was I going with that? What I was trying to remember to say is that buying direct from Lobby and MA with free shipping saves me about fifty dollars um, for a sweater's quantity versus what I would pay if I could buy her yarn at a local yarn shop because of the markup and stuff that they do. Um, so it's a really good deal. So I keep an eye out for those free shipping deals that she does and buy her yarn that way. Um, love this pattern. Let me just talk about the pattern. Uh, I didn't do any mods except for the neck. I made a, just a regular, like two inch, um, one by one rib. The pattern calls for a turtleneck, which I think you end up knitting about 12 inches. I want to say eight or 12 inches. I can't remember somewhere in there. Um, and <coughs> if you've never knit a turtleneck before, um, the key to success for a turtleneck is to get, is to change your needle size when you get to the point when you want to, um, start turning it. So I think, uh, Sloan's pattern has you change it three times. So you go gradually get into a larger and larger needle. So then when the turtleneck folds over, it stay it lays nice and doesn't try to curl inch back up. If you have a store-bought sweater, I have a couple that the... <laughs> turtleneck tries to unroll itself and it'll be like way up here on your on your neck um anyway yeah I didn't want the turtleneck I just thought I I like to wear turtlenecks but I don't like to wear them all the time and I thought like having a big turtleneck would maybe perhaps give me pause when I'm getting dressed in the morning or in the afternoon whenever I'm getting you know like reaching for the sweater would happen more often if it did not have that type of neck um, because I do really love pullovers and crew necks and v-necks. Um, but yeah, it was a really fun pattern. It's got a lot of positive ease as you can see here. I will um, spec it and spec it out, give you the bust measurement because I think I wrote some notes on my Ravelry project page. That, that all that info will be on my Ravelry project page. Um, this is the little bit left, about a half skein left of the fifth skein. So this was a five skein, four and a half skein project for me. I knit the size two because my gauge was off. So I knit the size two to get to the size three. I don't know how well I did because I haven't, this is literally right off the blocking mats. In fact, you saw this laying on the blocking mats in the clip I showed you about my move info and stuff you know, how I'm figuring out my yarn storage thing. I literally picked this up, put this on and started to record. Um, and it, I think it's actually still a little damp, just slightly, but it's, you know, wool is warm even when it's wet. That is the wonderful thing about wool. <laughs> uh, one of the nice things about wool, even when it's wet, it still keeps you warm. So I think it's the only, maybe silk does too, I'm not sure, but I know because protein, silk and wool are protein fibers. So um, wool, wool meaning like all, all animal fibers basically should operate that way. But wool in particular from sheep really does that. It's amazing. Um, so it might feel a little cool when you put it on like I'm experiencing right now. But by the end of this video, it's going to feel great. <laughs> this was a bit of a slog knitting wise. I started this this project in November. I put it on hold for December when I did some gift knitting, picked it back up in January, but it didn't go very quickly because I, um, I just, you know, the cables, it's not a lot of cable knitting. It's just four cables and, um, it's an eight row repeat and one of them, one of the cables you're doing something every other row. So every right side row, what would be right side? You are intended to knit this flat. However, Sloan gives you, you know, she says you, you can easily knit it in the round if you want. So I did knit it in the round up to the armhole and then I knit flat 
and then I um, you do a three needle bind off at the shoulders and then you pick up for the sleeves here it's a drop um, sleeve design so you can see the seam right there and then I knit top down on the sleeves and the sleeves have this beautiful um i think it's called andalusian rib texture it's really cool it's very easy to do it's a four row repeat really interesting texture nice and squishy and soft and then there's this garter panel in the front um, and the back is exactly the same it has the same cable layout uh here as this does here and a one by one rib hem very big one by one him and it's knit bottom up um i ended up tinking back quite a lot because i just you know it's a concentration knit so you need to pay attention to what you're doing and there were many times where i would have knit i knit maybe i purled when i should have knit because garter if you're doing garter in the round you're knitting them purling knitting them purling knitting them purling when it's flat you're knitting every row um so because you're knitting back and back on the front and the back um so there were some times where I messed that up, sometimes where I messed up the Andalusian stitch, some places where I one, at one point I had one of the cables twisting the wrong direction because so I just hadn't paid attention. So there was a lot of tinking back of this pattern. Um, but that's just, you know, me not paying attention or like spacing out, talking to people or watching a really good show. So that made it a little bit slower for me um, just because it was something that I had to pay attention to. So I didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't want to pick it up all the time. I was more interested in doing some of the things that were a little more mindless and a little bit easier to knit. Um, but nevertheless, I persevered and now it's done. And I realized that it is done in time for St. Patty's Day. Not that I ever paid too much attention to holidays and coordinating my dress, not since my children have grown up and left. Um, but it uh yeah it, I, i'm like great i love 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 that i have at least some reason i think i'm gonna wear the heck out of it the next few weeks anyway just because it's new and it's gonna be on the top of the pile and i'm probably gonna reach for it over and over until you know i've had until I'm, until my desire to wear it is satiated i will continue to to do that i wanted to just take a minute to talk about green um green Green, is, it, as a general rule of thumb, is a color that people have a lot of opinions about. So the particular shade of green, there, I think there are more shades of green than any other color. Like there's more nuances and stuff to green. And because of that, it means that people are very opinionated about the green that they like. So particular greens, um, people absolutely love and and or hate so i found that really interesting i love this shade of green this is just it's perfect it is really just the to me the perfect shade of green but you might hate it you might prefer a darker shade of green like this maybe an olive shade of green or you might prefer like a more limey shade of green brighter shade of green um with more yellow in it it's fine you know um I did read, I was reading up on upcoming trends and one of the trends for this spring, we're going to be seeing a lot of that sort of scummy pond slash limey green, like those yellow greens. We're going to be seeing a lot of those this spring in, um, in, in normal, what I would call normal fashion channels. I think you're seeing it somewhat in the knitting world. I was watching Grocery Girls and Jody was um showing off this like i would call it a lichen green or pond scum green uh yarn that she just bought from saunder yarn co so if you have yarn companies or if you um if you you know are a patron of yarn companies that pay attention to fashion um trends then you might be seeing more of that limey green um but that green's not for everyone some people love it. I know Kate, if you watch Katie Green Bean, I love her channel. She has been a fan of that color ever since I've started watching her a few years back. So I assume it's something that she's loved for a long, long time. So yeah, just FYI, enjoy that information. Do what you will with it. Um, 
while I, uh, since I picked up the box, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about the this candle that I just lit. It is also St. Patrick's Day inspired. It is from one of my favorite candle companies, Cantrip Candles. Uh, they did a limited batch. They're in, uh, they, they're located in LA, in Los Angeles. They have a brick and mortar shop and they have a huge online business. Um, they were a very tiny business that uh, only sold on, you know, through online. And um, it was typical of small businesses, like kind of what we experienced with Indie Yarn Dyers, where they do small batches and everything sells out. So that was what was, it was very, very hard to get these candles until the owner, I think his name is Christoph or Christian, something like that. Christoph, I think is what it is. The owner, he opened up this brick and mortar shop with the idea of there being a factory in the back, like a production area in the back. They're all made by hand though, still. So his production team are all doing everything by hand, but, but the prices are really awesome and the scents are amazing. They're just, um, it's Cantrip because Cantrip is a D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons um, term. And uh, that's, so it's all, they're D&D &D inspired or like fantasy inspired, most of them. Um, so, you know, you just have to parse through, read, read what the scents say they are, like what they, what the notes are. Um, so this particular one is called Shilligan's Irish Coffee Limited Batch. Um, it only was open, the order was only open for about a week and I just got it. It is a... It says, since its introduction to the shores of Shelligan, Irish coffee has inspired and satisfied many tavern patrons and adventurers. Triple distilled whiskey wheat or wheat whiskey blended with rich coffee topped with sweetened cream and chocolate shavings. Made in the candle form and poured the Shelligan way, may it lift your spirits and add some luck to your day. I just really love that. So yeah, it's a beautiful candle. And it has a little lucky penny in the top um, with a clover on it. So I'm probably just gonna leave that in there for a while and uh, fish it out when the candle's done. <laughs> Something like that. Um, yeah, so that is, that's that. Um, that lovely, oh, it smells so, so good too. It really smells like Irish coffee. There's like this blend of whiskey and coffee and it's, oh, I love coffee scented. Like he has another one called Coffee Shop that has like um, coffee and vanilla and it's really, really good. And it's amazing if you like coffee or even if you like the smell but don't like to drink it, you will love that candle. It is one of my favorites, but I love to light it in the morning when I work from home to just get me, wake me up, help me get going. I am spending a lot of time on non-wooly stuff. Sorry. Or I hope it's okay. Um, I have another finished object that uh, it's actually here, but I think I've wrapped it up by now. It is a gift. It's something I'm gifting. So I'm going to have you watch that clip. It's very quick. It just explains um, that finished object. Hi, I wanted to share a finished object with you before I gift it. I'll be gifting it to a friend um, ahead of recording my next full podcast. Um, this is the Manhattan Hat by Tori Yu, and um, this is the second one, this color. <laughs> this one I made for myself um, a while back, and um, this is the second one that I made in the same colors. I had two skeins of fingering weight yarn from Twisted Fitch. I don't think this dyer makes yarn anymore, dyes yarn anymore. They were a UK dyer. Um, and yeah, this was just a sock blend that I really loved the colors and I didn't know what to do with it. And as I was looking at my stash, um, towards the end of 2022 in December, I, you know, realized that these would make a really beautiful um, hat and I could hold two together for this hat pattern that is meant to have a worsted weight. So these make DK and I held together a skein of um, a Kid Sita 
or a strand of Kid Sita, which was a mohair silk blend. Um, this was an old one that I got. I don't even know. This has been in my stash for forever, and it's a 70-30 super kid mohair and 30% silk. Um, this one is this hat. It's funny to me, like they're both washed and blocked. I've worn this one a little bit. This one is much brighter. And I guess it was just that these one or both of these skeins got brighter as I got towards the end. Or it could also be the mohair. I used a slightly different mohair for this. That might be the difference in the color. Um, this one is also a little bit smaller because I, I literally knit every inch of this right into the pattern. In fact, I ran out. Um, right about here. I don't know if the camera's picking that up, but um, you really can't tell. There's a slight variation, but I think in the wearing of it, no one's going to get that close to it um, to really see that. Um, but as a result of the short yardage of mohair, this one is slightly shorter than this one, but I think it'll be fine. So yeah, that is a, yet another Manhattan hat by Tori Yu. So while we're talking about the Manhattan hat, yes, I have yet another one on my needles. Um, I, I am starting to wish I knit, I'm knitting socks instead of um, hats, but this was too good to pass up. Let me show you. Um, Yarn-wise, it was just too good to pass up. So it's another light blue hat. I don't know if I'm going to gift it or keep it. Um, and what this one is, is a, it's a little bit brighter. It's more, it's more like a regular baby blue. This one is a combination of, whoops, bummer, um, of Todd, Lamb and Kid Todd in the colorway K. So this is leftover yarn from a recent project that I made. It was, I only have one skein though, and I understand to make the 12 inch hat, like the one you just saw in the clip, um, the 12 inch length um, body of the hat, I need two skeins, like a skein and a half. So I'll be making this one shorter. I don't know where I'll end it. Um, and I am pairing it with um, some birdie from also from lamb and kid. This was gifted to me by a viewer. Thank you so much, Mary, for this kind gift. Um, she reached out and asked if I would like another skein or if I would like to try big birdie uh, or, or birdie, the um, Surrey alpaca yarn from lamb and kid. Let me just pull out the tag. Uh, nope, that is the Todd base. So it's Lamb and Kids Diamond Lane, and it is 74% alpaca, 26% silk, and you get 328 yards in a 50 gram skein. So I will have extra of this when I'm done um, because the Todd is only 150 yards, um, and it is a Yak Cashmere um, DK weight. So I'm holding a DK and a lace together for the Manhattan hat. And um, the colors don't match exactly, but in the fabric, they look amazing. It looks really, really good. And I think once I block it, it'll be even fuzzier than it is right now. Um, so yeah, that's about as far as I've gotten. I think I'll probably, I think this single fold is nine inches so I'm gonna aim for that and see how I do um, that my Todd base is or that Todd skein is not a full skein because I did use a little bit of it um, to finish up the other project I was making but but yeah um, and once this is done I will I like to keep a small project on the needles uh, either a hat or socks uh, that is pretty mindless knitting just for working on when I'm in meetings or if I'm go on the go somewhere. It's like nice to just throw this in my purse and um, have it. So yeah, and I have it in my Jezebel walking bag. Um, 
that I bought a long time ago. It has a denim bottom, and it's great. You can slide your arm in. So in the warmer weather, when I'm not wearing a heavy coat and carrying, I'm wearing gloves and stuff, I do use this to walk, because I do have a pretty long walk from the parking lot to my car. And I, once I move, I'll have a, a walk also from my apartment to my car, um, depending upon where I end up um, parking. I haven't figured that out yet, but I will. Yeah, so that's the Manhattan hat. Oh, let's talk about what Martha's wearing. I was lazy and didn't put a, um, it's a v-neck. I might take it down. Let me take it down from her. I just needed her to wear something. Um, I didn't want to take the needle, take it off the needle and put it on a cord so she could actually have it on. I just pinned it on to her. Um, but this is the slipover v-neck vest by Petite Knits. And um, it is a top-down vest. And so I'll be doing one by one armhole trim and a one by one rib. V that'll it looks quite low um like the that's the top of my bra right there so there would be some hella cleavage being shown if in fact I wasn't going to be filling this up with a nice big V <laughs> so um and anyway it's a vest so I don't intend to wear this alone um it's meant for layering as a layering piece but it, it's coming along pretty well I love the way the fabric is knitting up this yarn i'm actually alternating pairs so i'm going to show you that i think that the alternating is working really well um one note too which i think is just another sign at how forgiving this particular these colors of yarns are i didn't start alternating until after i split um for the armhole because it just seemed too tedious to me to be knitting back and forth with um alternating and i think I think it's working out really well. Like I can't tell where I didn't alternate and where I started alternating at all. It's a little bit of pooling, I would say, right in the middle there. But it's pretty forgiving. I and I think that's more characteristic of these colors and this and the way these yarns are dyed than it is of my knitting. <laughs> so yeah, I am holding a strand of fingering weight yarn and a strand of mohair silk. Um, this is one pairing. So you could see the mohair silk is very dark. And the um, this is a silk wool. Pretty sure it's a silk single ply um, called Divine Silky Singles Superwash Merino, 70% Superwash Merino, 30% silk um, in the colorway Nebula Colt. It was a one of a kind batch and I bought three skeins. I think that's all the dyer had. The dyer is called Enchanted Kettle. Um, this is old enough that when I bought it she was Acid Veil Dye Works. <laughs> um, yeah this is some of my oldest indie dyed stash. Um, but just to give you an idea this is the other skein that I'm alternating and you can see it's a lot more purple than this one. This one has a lot of golds, rust tones in it and this one not as much but I made up for that with the mohair because this mohair has more gold than this one. I think you can see that. This, this one's more purple. So I kind of crisscrossed the yarns, um, more purple mohair, more purple uh, skein, and they seem to be working really well. Um, the mohair were one of a kinds from Chelsea Lux, and they are regular 72% kid silk mohair, 28% silk. They were on sale. She had a big sale a while ago, a few years ago. I mean, I think she probably has sales. Many of them have sales, like maybe not on necessarily a regular basis, but I bought those. I bought, I did buy those mohair with the intention of holding them with this silk single ply um, because my thought was, okay, single ply, single ply yarn, not so strong, 
high silk content, very drapey. This has to be for a particular type of project. Um, I had it up for sale on my on my D stash page on Ravelry for a while. Nobody took it. So I moved it back into my stash and planned to do some type of garment where I would be holding the mohair um, along with the, the silk to just kind of give it some strength, the mohair silk to give it strength and durability. Um, but, a, you know, a thing that would also look really pretty and it would be okay if it was very drapey. So I think I, I think I scored. I think I hit a home run with this. I am really pleased with the results. I like it a lot more than I thought I would. Um, and yeah, I think I'm going to wear it quite a bit. Um, I have about two or three more inches to knit and then I'll do the rib and then I'll go back and do the rib trim and this will be done. So this should be done the next time I see you unless something unforeseeable happens and I um, either am not able to work on it or I get distracted with other things. Oh yeah, this is really nice. The pattern's fine. It's really easy to follow. Um, very nicely written and a mindless, enjoyable knit, <laughs> if I may say so. Okay, I have a new cast on. I haven't had a new cast on in a while. Oh, that's not true. I guess that hat is a new cast on, the light blue one, but I don't really count that because that's just like my way of coping with all the madness in my life is to just like reach for something familiar and just like knit, knit away. And this pattern is also familiar. Um, it is a uh, The Weekender by Andrea Mowry. And I um, just cast it on last night. She, so Andrea Mowry's doing her March to May knit along. So I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is something I've been wanting to knit for a while. Um, I was planning to knit it for, and I still may use it for that, um, for her spin it to knit it cowl, which is a year long cowl. And I think, I can't remember when she launched it, maybe around Tour de Fleece last year. So like in June or so. So it's coming into the home stretch and I had spun this yarn with this idea of um, making the weekender. So the spin it to knitted cowl, sorry, I have like fuzz in my, <laughs> I can feel it in the back of my throat. So I might have a little coughing fit <laughs> or if I'm catching my breath, that's why I can't seem to get it out. Anyway, um, spin it to knit it cowl, you are to spin a sweater's quantity of yarn and then make the weekender. Um, so I don't know if I can double dip in the cows, I will in the cows. I don't think I can, but I just figured it's March. I need to cast this on. This is yarn I spun for that project. Um, yeah, so I spun this, I made a swatch and then I blocked it. And this is the softest, softest swatch. I think I've felt in a long time that is a hundred percent wool without other things in it. Oh my gosh, it is so, so nice. Actually, I think there might be a touch of silk in it. I have the, I have the fiber things. Let me just check. I know, so the black that you're seeing is Finn. Um, I worked with a, a four ounce bundle of roving from solitude wool that was made from their fin sheep and then i worked with two akara yarn braids that are oh 100 percent pull worth okay so yeah these are all akara yarn she's a canadian indie dyer um yeah so these are all 100 percent wool there's no silk so the two i had two braids that were 100 percent pull worth from um Oh my goodness, I forget the dyer's name, but a carry yarn. And then one four ounce. So together, the 12 ounces together make, made up this yarn. And I did kind of a blended fractal um, spin. So it, it is going to have a little bit of self striping. And I only have about two inches of the ribbing. Um, the Weekender is a bottom up pattern 
and you knit the back ribbing and then you knit the front ribbing and then you put them together and start knitting the body. So you can see there is a little bit of a striping happening, a little bit of colors blending and moving. Um, I'm getting to the tail end of the black and white section and then I'll be moving into more of those blue and there's like a caramel color in there too. I think I'm really gonna like this. Very excited. I have about 1200 yards of this yarn. Um, I spun it as a two ply. I think I wanna say I spun it in late summer, early fall of last year. But if you look at my project page, if you're really curious about learning more about the spin, look at my project page for the yarn and it'll tell you, usually I write what episodes you can hear about this um, yarn and um, I assume it's probably just one, maybe two. Um, and this swatch, which I took from that same skein, you can get a better idea of how the yarn will stripe. Of course, this is smaller than, uh, <laughs> than the, that. Um, this sweater too, I was reading in it when I was picking out the size. I think I normally knit size three, um, which is supposed to give you a 47 inch bust. I have a 40 inch bust and the pattern calls for a 10 inches of ease. Um, so <laughs> I was like, hmm, I think I'm just gonna go with 47. Uh, so that is why it is looking so wide. Uh, also, my gauge isn't matching 100%, so I may be making this size two. I think I'm making size two to get a three, just like I did with this. I'm a loose knitter, so I usually need to finagle the pattern somewhat to make it work. Except for Stephen West, who's a very loose knitter. So I usually go down. I usually have to knit tighter than him. Yeah, either by going down a needle size or, yeah. Anyway, most patterns though, I am on the looser side of the gauge. Like whenever I see a gauge that says um, 26 inches for four inches on US size five, I'm like, I'm never gonna get that. <laughs> Mine is gonna be about 22, maybe 20. So. <laughs> These are things that you learn as you knit more and more. Oh, I was gonna say that's all my knitting, but I, I lied, I have another. This might be a new cast on. I probably talked about this last time. Um, I've been working on, I finished up last time, I remember I had finished the 10 skein throw that I made for one of my sons. And I think I showed you the yarn that I was going to be working with for my other son, one of my other sons. I have three sons, three adult boys. Um, two are partnered, one is not so far. He'll be partnered soon, I'm sure. He's adorable and someone will snatch him up. Anyway, he loves purples. So I went through my stash and found purple skeins and I am making a marled one by one rib purple throw that will end up being about 45 inches by 65 inches, like typical throw size. Um, when I block it, it will open up like this. Right now it's looking kind of, you know. Um, and what I'm doing is holding 10 strands together, 10 strands of fingering weight yarn to create this moral effect. What's good about holding this many skeins together <laughs> is that you can have some ugly ones or ones that you don't necessarily like and they just kind of blend in. They like become background and you don't really have to worry about it. So there were a couple skeins that I was like, I really don't like these, but I think they're gonna look great in this. <laughs> so yeah, I really am happy with it. I, I think I have about maybe a little over two feet knit so far which would give me about, yeah, so maybe I'm about halfway, a little bit, little bit less because as I block it and pull it open, it will shrink up a bit. So I'll, I'll probably knit 70 or so inches to get to 65. Also this boy, this 
man, young man, is the biggest of my kids. He's the tallest and the broadest. So if it comes out being a little bigger, a little longer, all the better, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm just holding various, like this was my way originally when, um, around Christmas, when one of my sons asked for a throw, cause he said he didn't have any and he would love a hand knit throw. I was like, Oh, and I know that boy and his partner, I'm calling them boys because that's what I call them, but they're, they're young men. They are all, um, my oldest is 31 and my other two are 28. So, um, this is one of the 28 year olds. He and his partner love black. So I had made a black throw for them. And this son loves purple and blues. So, um, yeah, I went through my stash and just found a lot of purples and blues. In fact, I had bought a sweaters quantity of the yarn I'm using for the vest, so I threw, I'm throwing the the third skein into this blanket, and this was the one that was the most variegated, like it had the most amount of like golds and stuff, but this looks great in this blanket. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is coming along, and it's, you know, it's kind, it's a chunky knit on big fat needles, size 17 needles, and if you're wondering about the recipe, uh, it's no, there's no pattern. It's just cast on 65 or set, 65 to 75 stitches, I would say, depending on how wide you want it. The last one I cast on to, uh, 73 stitches and it worked out to be 45 inches wide, but that was on size 15. I'm using size 17 for this one, which I think I like a lot better. It makes a little bit more drape, a little bit more air in the knit. Um, so I only cast on 65 stitches, but I kind of wish I cast on a few more, like maybe did 67 or 69. I think that might've been a little bit better. Um, so this is how it looks on the needle, which is a 40 inch needle. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Cause so once I open it up, it'll definitely be that 45, maybe even 48. Um, but yeah, this is not a not a travel knit at all. This is sit on the couch and watch, you know, a movie. There is a bit of, um, I do have a little, you know, from time to time where I don't manage to pick up all 10 strands. Um, usually I backtrack and then, you know, loop it back up on the needle. Uh, or when I come across it, the next row, I'll loop it back up. Um, but the method I found that's working really well in case you are also inclined to make a 10 skein <laughs> this is actually like a 15 skein project so you hold 10 strands together you can work in scraps no problem um and if you saw as i was holding it up there's probably some ends dangling in there um yeah and i'm using bibs and bobs mini skeins included like whatever whatever is working and um it'll pretty much use up it, i won't use up all i in the black one i used up all the black yarn i had in my stash all the single skeins and all the scraps. For this one, I'm probably not gonna use all the purple. I have a lot of purple. So <laughs> I still have some skeins um, and scraps and they're, they're over on the bed. I have everything laid out on that bed. Um, but what I was gonna say to help you um, not lose a strand, I find it helps to like kind of pull out and loop back on itself like this. Like, so you end up with nice smooth you know, a few yards of some nice smooth amounts and all of those um, bumps and kinks in the yarn will kind of work themselves out as you do this. And then I drop all of that back in the knitting bag and then knit that up and then do it again, repeat that again, that process. And that really helps sort of create this, um, this kind of strand that ends, you know, single fat strand of 10 strands. You could do more though too. You could actually add more if you wanted more strands. Um, but this has been like, it's really satisfying to use up all of these single skeins that have been, been some of them have been in my stash for years. Like, and all these scraps, these like partial skeins that I'm always just like, I have way too much of this stuff. And you know, I need to make a trip down to my local yarn shop to donate. But on the other hand, I'm like, hmm. 
maybe I'll use it for something or I come up with some scrappy yarn project. But yeah, this is super satisfying. I have a third one planned because I always have wanted a yellow blanket, like a yellow or gold blanket. So I, I, as I was re-sorting my yarn stash um, to move the storage from the dresser that I'm sitting next to to the new unit that it'll all be sitting in, not new, new for it, new for yarn, not new to me. I pulled out my yellow skeins and I have enough. I definitely had en have enough. I did not think I would. I thought I would have to dig into my hand spun a little bit to maybe boost the amount, but I'm pretty sure I have enough. I would say I probably have as much yellow yarn, yellow and gold yarn as I had a black. So yeah, it's gonna be plenty and it'll get another 15, 16 skeins worth of yarn out of my stash. Yes, I realize this is like a $500 project, <laughs> but so satisfying. I collected a whole bunch of single skeins from 2016 to about 2018. And I just bought, you know, like you do, a couple skeins here, a couple skeins there, thinking that I was, you know, I was like building a collection. And then I stopped because I wasn't knitting with all of them. And I just focused on more project-based knitting, like, okay, I'm going to purchase this group of yarn because this is for a particular project and this group of yarn because this is for a particular project. And whether or not I used it or not, at least I put it in my stash and was like, this is a sweater's quantity or a shawl's quantity instead of having all of these random skeins that I may or may not want to use. So not having stash or having less stash will free me to do more purchasing for future projects, if that makes sense. I, I know a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there on YouTube, a lot of YouTubers who talk about management of their stash and what they're doing and de-stashing and all of that. Mine is purely driven by this move right now. I probably would have, you know, lollygagged around with that, all of those, you know, I think I said I had about over 70 single skeins, Sing, not, skein, not skeins that were single, but just one, one skein of a color in my stash. And doing that black throw, cut that down by 12, doing this purple one's gonna cut it down by 14, maybe 15, doing the yellow one's gonna cut it down by another 12. So that feels really good to cut those single skeins, the amount I have in half. In looking at my single skeins, I have a lot of pinks and I have a lot of blues and blue greens and greens maybe i should do a green one and gift that to someone i may to see how it goes i think once i move it's going to be hard for me to sit down and knit as much as i'm knitting now because i'm doing a lot of waiting right now but i think once i move for the short term anyway i'm going to be doing a lot of organizing and putting things away and figuring things out and i may not necessarily feel so inclined to sit down and knit um also these heavy blankets are really great for winter months. I may not want such a heavy knit on my needles in the summer. So maybe it's something that I'll pick up again in the fall. I don't know. But this one I'll definitely finish soon. I got halfway done in two weeks. So another two weeks I should finish it. And then I can gift it to him. Um, he's the one that actually lives the closest to me. I'm so happy about that. I, don't, I hope he is too. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, that's all my knitting. And I have a, a little bit of spinning I'm going to share with you now.
this bin, which I think I started in November. This is some um, Polworth Silk by Kim Dyes Yarn. It was a seasonal special that she called Seasons Change. And it is a 25% silk, 75% BFL. It is really gorgeous yarn. It is um, not my colors though, not colors that I would wear necessarily. It would work on my kids, I think. But I have a total of three skeins. This is just the one I finished. That add up to about 700 yards. I put them for sale on my D-Stash page on Ravelry if you're interested in purchasing them. I thought I would try it. I don't know how well that works um, in general. I also put up some project bags and I had a couple Hohe project bags that I posted. They're long gone and they sold pretty much immediately, like within a day of me posting those. So I don't really know, I haven't look shop d stash in a while but i think the way it works is that the most recent d stashes sit at the top on that first page so people saw them and purchased them they were really i did a fire sale on some hohe project bags that i never use um so i just figured i'd try selling some hand spun there so if you're interested it is a worsted weight um it would probably be a good uh, it'll it'll um it'll change it'll change in the knitting of it like it'll color change a little bit it's really pretty it's like a grayed purple with pops of um like a terracotta warm rose gold color in there really really beautiful just not colors i wear but you know, nice. And the softness, the drape on that fabric is going to be amazing. So I don't know if you're interested. Yeah. Go through Ravelry. If you're not on Ravelry and you're interested, do let me know, um, by emailing me down in the description box. I started another spin. This is one of my spins from my advent. And you saw a clip of that from, um, yesterday morning I think uh, I got one bobbin done I'm making I'm working on a two ply a color changing fractal spin um, yeah this is from Ingle Nook Fibers if you're familiar they are two sisters nuns sisters that way not biological sisters that dye fiber I don't think they dye any yarn. I think they just dye fiber. I'm not sure if they have their own sheep or if they just, you know, money generating things though for friars and for nuns is common, especially if they're more, you know, some of these old um, school like tangible materials like, you know, there's a cheese, there's a cheese maker, a nun who's a cheese maker in Connecticut. And I think they are also in Connecticut. I don't know if they're at the same farm. But um, anyway, for for their, I bought their advent, their 12 day advent, and what they gave us was a gradient, a blue green gradient of fiber. And each day you opened a little fiber bump. And I ordered glitter, so I wanted sparkle or glitter, so it has a little bit of, of um, metallic in there and some little neps and things like that. So what I did was I divided the, um, the fiber bumps into two parts there were 12 of them so six per bobbin and then I am spinning them in um, color order uh, light to dark I can't remember how it goes I think it goes like this something like that and there's two more colors that are darker they're not all identical like these six are not identical to what was on this bobbin and you're, I ended with the darkest. What I did for this bobbin, because I'm doing a fractal, which means you do to a one to two ratio, so two, one part to two parts, or two parts to four parts, or four parts to eight parts, et cetera, et cetera. Three parts to six parts, so it's always one to two. Um, with this bobbin, I took each of these little fiber bumps and I divided them in two. So this other one, this second bobbin, I'm 
going to divide them into four and then spin them that way because I just wanted the color to change more frequently. The whole amount is five ounces, so I'll end up with a really big, it's really pushing my spinning wheel to its max capability. <laughs> five skein, five ounce skein is probably as big as I can spend. It may even be a little over what I should be able to, what I am going to be able to fit on the bobbins, but it's okay. It should work. I've done big, big five ounce, um, more than five ounce skeins in the past. I learned I really don't like spinning that much in one go, but because of this, I didn't really want to divide it into two and a half and two and a half ounces, ounce skeins. I figured this is a nice way to work the yarn. So, or to, to spin the yarn. So yeah should have that to show you next time um i think it's going to be really pretty and fun and it should self-stripe somewhat in a really cool way all shades of blue and green yeah that is uh and that's spinning and i don't have any acquisitions be for the obvious reason that i am trying to downsize my stash at least a little bit although everything is fitting pretty much there's a little bit left in this cabinet behind me which I showed you this cabinet I'm not going to keep it's just it's a really inexpensive garden tool like it's meant for gardening like you put your bulbs in each of the things and it was really cheap I bought it for under 100 bucks like 60 dollars or something like that from a garden center store just because I thought, oh, this looks, this looks like it's gonna work well for yarn. And it does, but I won't have room for it. So um, yeah, so I just need to get out the rest of that. I need some more baskets for the smaller cabinets and then I'll get all that out and everything will have a place, I think. With this idea of like making things fit, knitting up what I have and so that there's more room for what I have that fits, that will fit. Um, Exploring woolly myths. I have not done exploring woolly myths in quite some time um, since the beginning, since like November, because uh, it is a newish segment that I started, I want to say like late spring last year and maybe, maybe even summer. And what I do is ask viewers to please send in questions that they might have or a myth that they might be interested in exploring having me explore and debunk or say that it's right some of them we found out have been correct and other ones we found out are not correct um so i wanted to talk to you today about a woolly myth that was sent in by a viewer lynn she sent it in in october so it's i'm a little behind i have a handful of other um other things other questions but please feel free to submit I will get to them um, at, you know as I go I think I have far fewer requests for exploring worldly myths than um, I will be able to get you know I'll definitely be able to get to all of them that I have right now um, in the coming months or month or two so here's the question that Lynn sent in she says since the pandemic I see lots of articles about how young people have discovered knitting the assumption seems to be that prior to the last few years, knitting was primarily an old lady activity. I'm old enough that I seem to remember several such resurgences. Are there really more young people learning about fiber crafts now than in the past? Or is it a case where it's only a new phenomena to the authors of these articles? I think it's some of column A and some of column B. That's my general, um, sense of that but I did look at some of the digging or I dug around and found some statistics so let me share with you um, I I went to I found two sources so the academic in me always wants three sources um, but I found two and they were pretty much agreeing with each other um, so I, I sort of took that as okay these are probably pretty accurate now just know that statistics in general there's always, you know, a positive negative, like, you know, there's a spread really. So this is kind of the middle of the spread. So though I may say 15% um, is this or 20% is that, it might really be 18 or it could really be 22. Um, so just keep that in mind. 
So I did find some statistics from um, a retailer, a Swiss, a European retailer from Switzerland uh, called Galaxis, and they reported that the sales of knitting needles and sewing machines and fabric scissors and wool rose by 646% from April 2020 to March 21, and I know that doesn't get to your question about age, but we're gonna get to that. Um, and then they also cited people like, notable people like Michelle Obama being a knitter, and that that kind of elevated the craft and made it, made, you know, spread awareness to more people. Um, yeah, and they go on to say that, um, other crafting stores have reported a you know a um, sales increase on things that have to do with home crafts like so sewing and knitting and stuff like that anywhere from 155 percent increase to 310 percent increase um, during those pandemic years um, from 2020 to 20 to now to 2022. Um, other companies have reported, like Lion Brand, um, increase in sales of 80%, and then We Are Knitters, an increase of sale, sales by 75%. And also looking at new subscribers. So this one, this particular one was, um, survey was focused from, focused on what retailers or people in the biz were experiencing um, in terms of their sales to just show that there has been an increase in sales. Um, terms of knitting demographics. These I actually found very interesting. This was from fall, September of 2022. Um, in terms of the median age, let me just click on all age info. The median age of the average age of knitters has been determined to be about 50 years old. There are young people knitting, um, but there's still a lot more middle-aged people knitting. <laughs> um, 40 plus, 40, 40 years plus is probably the most common. About 80% of the knitters are in are over 40. Um, there's a smaller percentage, about 10% that are 30 to 40 years old, and then 8% are 20 to 30 years old. Um, so, yeah. I think, Lynn, you're right. It's just the, um, I think all the crafts kind of got a resurgence during the pandemic, uh, just in general. And whether or not people stick with it, that remains to be seen. I found some other really interesting stats that I thought you might enjoy, um, just because they were part of this um, survey. Male-female ratio. Males actually comprise 26% of knitters. I think you might find that surprising because it doesn't feel like that. So that means one in four knitters are male. In terms of race, 54% of knitters are white, 22 are Latino or Latinx, 14% are black or African-American, 4.5% Asian, 4% unknown, less than 1% Native American, um, or Alaskan native, according to this demographic. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then some other facts about knitters, which is fun. 88% um, of knitters feel less stressed when they knit. 40% reported that it helps knitting helps fight depression. To relieve stress after a long day, knitters will first grab their knitting needles, their second response was zone out in front of the TV, and third response, pour themselves a drink. 51% <laughs> of knitters reported spending eight hours per week on their projects. I guess that's the average. I, cert I think I spend more than eight hours, but you know, whatever works for you, no judging. Uh, 77% of knitters buy their supplies from brick and mortar shops, 4% buy outside of physical stores, which could be online, and 19% buy from both sources. Um, and knitting sales, the knitting industry grew slightly over the past three years, about 1%, which isn't huge. Um, 
a lot, I think these stats aren't necessarily up to date. It looks like they're looking at some old data from 2019. So it's not necessarily that 1% might be from 2018 to 2019. Um, so I, I think it probably grew a little bit, but also there was a slump because once people started to get back out in the world, I think that there was some, you know, some leveling out of how much people were crafting. About 80% of knitters are right-handed and 10% are left-handed. The remaining 10% are ambidextrous. And yeah, I think that's I think that's about all the interesting stats that um, I found. There's of course a few more, but I don't want to belabor the stats and get beyond the question. Um, the question, I guess, to answer it, we'd need to know how if that eight percent of those young adults, the twenty to thirty year olds, if that changes over the years. So that survey was conducted in um, twenty twenty one in summer of twenty twenty one. So we don't know. We would need to rerun it to see if there is an increase or decrease. I mean, I know for myself, like I've been knitting since I was 17 years old and I know right up until I was in my 40s probably, every time I went into a yarn shop, the answer was always like, oh, it's so nice to see a young person knitting. And I always felt like I was the youngest in the crowd. And I've actually, I've talked to my local yarn shop um, owner Nancy of of knit tapestry and she and I said to her you know it would be nice to not be the youngest and she goes oh you'll still be the youngest <laughs> uh, which I don't think is true I think you know I think I'm probably in the middle there but yeah anyway I hope you enjoyed that answer Lynn I hope that helped you um get a better understanding of who's knitting these days. It's still women mostly, and it's still mostly people in their 40s or older. Um, because I think we just have more leisure time. Like young adults are really more um, busy trying to meet their partner, meeting their partner, marrying their partner, raising kids with their partner, <laughs> all, of, all of those driving, dri you know, driving themselves up the career ladder where I think when once you sort of hit your stride in your middle ages, your middle years, you, you know, your career is established. You don't have to work so hard on it. You get a little bit more space in your brain to focus on hobbies and things like that. So it's probably a lot of what drives um, some of those numbers. At least I would, I would, um, I would say. So, oh, so also Willie Myths, if you want to tell me, I, there's a form, a Google form down below. You can... Um, submit your question or your your thought or anything um, just click the link and it will take you to that form um, so I have I wanted to ask before I go I have two books that I have doubles of one is Knitlandia by Clara Parks and one is Japanese Knitting Stitch Bible I wanted to ask if any of you viewers would like them. Um, I first thought perhaps I would just um, ask you to pay for shipping. Or if you want to give me some money towards shipping, that would be great. But I just want them to go to a good home. So if you want either one or the other, let me know. I may throw in some project, project bag too, just because I want them to go to a good home where they'll be loved. Um, so do let me know if you're interested in this and either one of them or both. Um, and I will, um, I'll send them to you. I'll ship them to you. So I'm just, I was just trying to think about, I'll put my email down below, my, my um, knitting email address. So you can just let me know that way. Or if you are following me, or friends with me on Ravelry or on Instagram, you could direct message me either one of those places as well if that's more comfortable for you. Um, you know, just tell me which book and give me your address and I'll send them to you. I might throw in some other stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Skinny yarn. I don't know. No promises. I'm just, it'll be on a whim and it'll depend on who who's asking. So yeah, do let me know.
if you want either one of those because I have two copies of each of those and I could have sworn I had another book that I have a second copy of but I couldn't find it so if I find it I'll talk about it next time I think that's it for my episode I hope you enjoyed this little episode this update of my knitting and my life where I'm at um I will be back I hope in two weeks unless something it, it goes different than I think it's gonna go <laughs> You should be back in two weeks. And I will see you again in no time. Take care. Bye. Mm-hmm.